page 411. Our call to confession, we have confidence in God's mercy. Therefore, let us confess our sins. Our prayer of confession, O oh God, you heal the brokenhearted. Save us from sin where we inflicted on our neighbors. Those who deprive us. We seek refuge on those who hurt us. Some we judge inferior since they don't meet our standards. Others we deem unworthy of our respect and support. Jesus had compassion upon all who were afflicted. Forgive us, O oh God, when our hearts are hardened against neighbors in need. Please take a few moments of your own for your own silent prayer of confession. Our assurance of pardon. The assurance of our pardon resided in Christ, who, though he was in for form of God, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Today he intercedes on the behalf of human weakness before the great throne of God. Therefore, let everyone knee bow and let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therein lies our assurance that we are forgiven. Call us through your word, read and proclaimed. Holy God, may our eyes be opened and our hearts willing to follow wherever your spirit leads. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told? you from the beginning. Have you not understood since the earth was founded? 
He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and the whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? <clears throat> Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and the young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Now I'll turn the service over to Reverend Rick. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see so many turn out today. I know it was kind of scary this morning. Look outside and this big ball of fire in the sky. We haven't seen it in a while. It's just the sun. Glad you all knew, figured that out eventually, and you all came out today. It's good to see everybody as we gather together once again in covenant worship. Whether we gathered here today in person or those joining us online, we welcome you as well. Giving back the first part of our brand new week to the one who has given us everything. Amen. Amen. Continuing in our service then, our reading from the New Testament comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll be reading verses 16 through 23. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became to the weak to win the weak. I have became all things to all people, so that by possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad together. Amen. 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 And the Lord has given us yet another reason to celebrate today, a day that you may not be aware of, but once you hear about it, you may want to go out and celebrate in the Lord's name as well. Because it is today, according to the national calendar, February 4th, 2024 is National Dump Your Significant Jerk Day. I can see some of you couples elbowing each other. Just let me get through the rest of the sermon before you all start getting ideas in your head, okay? Now, a quick disclaimer, this following report comes directly from their website and does not necessarily reflect, reflect the views of your pastor, as we will elaborate as time goes on. But according to the website, National Dump Your Significant Jerk Day is celebrated around the world on the first Sunday of February each year. Do you or someone you know have a relationship with someone who is just plain awful? If the answer is most likely yes, fear not. 
Dump Your Significant Jerk Day is the perfect occasion for finally getting rid of that jerk once and for all. This holiday encourages those who need a little push to reclaim their lives and stop allowing themselves to be mistreated. Ironically, it is during the month of February, the month of love, but I think it makes even better sense because self-love is just as important. The origins of this holiday are unknown, but it is likely that whoever created this holiday was tired of their relationship and wanted to encourage others to take the necessary steps towards happiness. As the saying goes, life is short and there are a lot of fish in the sea. Why would you waste it in a relationship that makes you feel bad because you aren't treated with love and respect? It is far preferable to remain signal than to waste your valuable time with someone who is a jerk to you. How will you ever find Mr. or Mrs. Right if you are preoccupied with Mr. or Mrs. Wrong? Celebrate this holiday by calling it quits on your bad relationship. It's quite simple. Dump Your Significant Jerk Day was created to give people who have a seriously bad relationship with someone an excuse to finally dump them once and for all. We've all been there, believe me. Why are we siding with them? Why do my friends always question why I'm with this person when they are constantly berating me? When you hear comments like this from people, more often than people signing your praise, singing praises about your partner, it's probably time to find somebody new. Or at the very least, time to get rid of the old one. As the saying goes, sometimes you just have to do things for yourself. As our opening quote suggests, it can be difficult to get out of a relationship once you are into it. After all, they are there. And while they might not be the best company, you are truly never alone. Unless they go out for a night and simply don't bother coming home until late. Dump your significant jerk day reminds you that you are more than that. Now I do realize in this day and age, the steps to maintain the relationship have changed dramatically over the years since I last dated anyone. And I could agree to a certain point that sometimes, when you're trying to maintain a relationship with someone, you or that special someone turns out to be a jerk, for whatever reason. The problem is, becomes what exactly defines what a jerk is as it pertains to a relationship. The feeling I get when I read this article is that the term jerk is someone who mistreats the other party of a relationship to the point to where it might become, start becoming abusive, whether it be physical or emotional. And if that is the case, I would believe that you have your rights to dump that significant jerk. However, in today's day and age, the definition of jerk could stretch even to the tiniest bit of indifference. For example, if you ask my wife, shortly after we were married, she would probably tell you that I was a jerk because I continued to fail to put down the toilet seat. Now, in my defense, it was something I didn't usually do when I was in the military with a bunch of guys. However, after we were married, it was something that I worked on to avoid not to do anymore. Why is that? Because most of us know any good relationship actually takes compromise on both sides in order to maintain, maintain the respect for each other that makes a relationship work and last longer. Now, I'm not saying this as if I were the expert on what it takes to make a good relationship work. Granted, my wife and I have been married, let's see what, it's 2024. Take away the, take the, a really long time. And during my, and granted my wife and I, and if you all knew me during my high school years, you would know that the fact that I can stand before you and say that I have been married for so long with three kids is further proof, not only of God's existence, but of God's mercy and compassion. Now maybe it's just me, but doesn't it seem to you all like the term marriage is not the same as what it used to be years ago? Like when people got married, you got married. You found someone else, and in each other you came together as one, and agreed, coming before God and all of those witnesses, that you would love each other, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, until death did you part. Now fast forward to today where marriages are just like toasters. Once they break, you throw one out and get a new one. Because, and I know this may sound like a little something, different and weird to some of you born around the turn of the century, but there was actually a time when we would go out of our way to fix a toaster. 
Even if it meant taking it back to the place where you bought it and having the appliance repair guy look at it and paying him a fee. Now don't read into that more than any of the, than face value, folks. I'm not saying you need to take your spouse back to your in-laws and have them fix them so that you can fall in love with the person over again from the beginning. I am saying that somehow over the course of the years, we have become lazy in taking the easy way out that has become commonplace in anything we do, whether it be a marriage or even in a relationship with a family member or a sibling or a cousin, or dare I say it, even God. Because it's easy to forget God when things are going very well. And to that point, it's also easy to begin yelling at God when things don't go well or things aren't going your way. Now you start to get to a conflict with a loved one. Your loved one could just walk away or you could also just walk away. The great thing about the relationship with God is that God never walks away. The problem is we fail to remember that fact. Whether you've been a believer for 50 years or five minutes, or you've never even made that commitment to Jesus Christ, the fact remains that God never walks away from you. Now, coincidentally, this was the message that the Old, Prof Old Testament uh, prophet Isaiah was telling in our reading this morning. Now, before we delve into this reading, let me try to set the scene for you a little bit and give you some details on what leads us to the point in this message this morning. As we come to the part of the message that I like to call Bible Basics for Your Brain. Now, our Old Testament reading this morning came from the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah stands at the peak of the Old Testament as a literary genius among all of the Hebrew prophets. Now, his ministry ran from 740 to 686 BC and ran under four different kings in the nation of Judah during that time. Now, the kingdom of Judah was under threat from the takeovers of the Assyrian and the Babylonian armies as they were threatening the nation. Now, God commissioned Isaiah as a prophet to warn the people of Judah that if they didn't turn away from their idol worship or their sinful behavior, that God would bring them destruction by allowing these armies to come in and take them over. Now, the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah is nothing but Isaiah telling them and warning the people of this fact. Well, they didn't listen. And lo and behold, the Assyrian armies come in, destroyed the cities, and scattered the people. So now we get to the second half of Isaiah, the second half of the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah prophecies turns more towards peace and the rebuilding of the nation of Judah. And here we start to see the renewed call to start the news of comfort that God indeed has never left them, and that He will also bring His people together. Now, as we start here in verse 21, remember, the nation has just been overtaken and just been destroyed, and the people have just been scattered. And even though the people had been warned by Isaiah that this fact would come, they decided not to listen to Isaiah's warnings. And now that everything is destroyed, they, like we, when things go wrong our way, we just are asking God, why? So reading again from verse 21, God says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? In essence, God's just saying, remember me? Here I am, still here. And Isaiah continues to relate God's message that God is still there as the passage continues. Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings pieces to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely they are planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows up upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. So then Isaiah relays God's message as it pertains to the people of Judah worshiping other idols. In verse 25, to then whom will you compare me, or whom is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and see who created these. He who brings the host and numbers them because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. God again, remember me? Still here. All those other things you put into pla place, excuse me, put into place thinking that they were me? Not so much. You weren't hiding anything from God, as Isaiah tells them in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by God? 
And then he repeats what he started out with. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of heavens and the earth. He does not go faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths were faint and be weary, that the young will fall exhausted. Anyone who has ever raised kids or grandkids knowing to have a youth faint or become exhausted is a nearly impossible task. Can I get a witness? No matter how young you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter what you are putting your faith in, whether it be your fortune, your possessions, or even your relationships, everything will fall before God who created it in the first place. And as we put our trust into things of this world, as long as things are going well, we tend to forget that there is even a higher power that has allowed us to have those fortunes or blessings that we've had in the first place. And that higher power even sent his son to redeem you from your faults and allow those who believe in him a part of eternal life. Isaiah reiterates this fact in verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our abilities to do anything, whether it be keeping a relationship going or to avoid one harping on us, comes from the one that we get all our strength from and from whom all our blessings continue to flow from. Now, I am ashamed to admit that there are times when I try to do things on my own, and, when and it's only when times get tough that I become humbled to remember that God is still there. And then I have to ask God not only to forgive my insubordinates, but to ask for his strength and his guidance in the first place, which I should have done in the first place, to allow me to accomplish the job at hand. But don't take my word for it. Let's take the words of Paul from the Church at First Corinthians letter he wrote that we read in our New Testament reading this morning. Paul gives here a story of his own life, how he managed to bring those closer to Christ as he set up his many churches. But first he gives us the reason of why he is doing what he is doing. So reading again from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no round for boasting, for an obligation has been laid on me. And woe to me if I then do not proclaim the gospel. For I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am then entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. So now that we have the why from Paul, Paul now tells us about the how, verse 19. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became under the law, though myself was not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak so I could win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might, by all means, save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, so that I may also share in its blessings. So Paul is saying that in order to bring people closer to Jesus, then he had to, in some way or another, become like one of them, like those who were Jewish, like those who were weak, like those who were even strict in following the temple laws or those who weren't following the temple laws at all. Even though Paul didn't fall completely into their lives while doing so. Those of you who were here last week might remember that from the message last week. Yes, he may have had to fall outside of his comfort zone in order to do what he did. Then he may have to compromise on some things or at least begin to do things that were normally outside of his comfort zone. And he would be like those he was trying to reach in order to earn their respect or earn their trust, whatever you want to say it, in order to befriend them to where they would want to listen to the gospel that he was preaching and that he was making available to them. So in the long term, the end results would be bringing them closer to Jesus Christ. Now that process sounds pretty easy as we're reading it on paper, but I'm sure just like us, when we try to do the same thing, we know that that task is a lot harder than it looks here on paper. 
However, that is what Paul chose to do again and again in order to bring people closer to Jesus Christ. And even though Paul went to these lengths, as it says in the letter, he didn't save them all. Even though he had the opportunity to save them all, not everyone was saved from what Paul was doing. But just like in any good relationship, it does work better if both sides are on the same page. However, even in the best of relationships, a lot of those times, this isn't the case. But as Paul is our example, we can't just give up on bringing those people to Jesus. Jesus calls us to keep trying. Unfortunately, we serve a God that gives us what we need when we need it. And even in circumstances, certain circumstances allows us to fail so that we can continue to progress, to succeed. So even though a day is designated to dump that significant jerk, maybe think twice about that. At least pray and see what God wants you to do, and perhaps follow the example of Paul, so that maybe, just maybe, we can continue to be the light that Jesus has called us to be. In conclusion, it takes work not to be a jerk. Just make sure you unplug that toaster before you start working on it. Let us all stand together and sing, and sing if you're able, hymn number four, or 255 in the blue play, praise manual. Now praise the Lord. Let us recite what we all believe in reaffirming our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As I call our ushers forward, let us now present our tithes and our offerings to the Lord this day. can hope to bestow you. You are God of all creation and the source of all goodness. We dare to approach you with our gifts of thanksgiving. Receive them as symbols of our wholehearted praise. Transform what we bring to you to harmonize with your wishes and convert all of our actions accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The time in our service this morning where we share our joys and concerns, just a quick up, quick again, to remind you of the announcements uh, in your bulletin that Sue brought up to your attention. Boy Scout Sunday next week, Super Bowl Sunday next week, installation of new officers next week. No reason you shouldn't be here next week. A lot of things going on. Uh, and we'll start with our joys this morning. Any joys we want to bring to the congregation's attention this morning? Nothing at all. I guess I already mentioned the suns. That was the big thing, right? Yeah. I see, uh, I'm, I'm a kind of a techno nerd. So I see Elon Musk was in the news this week again. You see this company has now completed the first prototype of the flying car. Did you see that? Yeah. And now the next start, the next phase of the project is of course to try to find people to test drive this thing. I guess it's his new pilot program. 
And do you want to share with the congregation this morning? Bring our attention then to our concerns. I call your attention to the prayer list and our bulletin this morning, and of course, any other uh, people we want to bring to the congregation's attention. Yep. I guess I just wanted to mention that Glenda's husband there has and the services are um, will be on Friday, the beginning of Thursday evening, five to seven, and the service is on Friday at three weeks. So we want to keep the Ely family in prayers this week. Any other uh, any other concerns or people we want to bring to the congregation's attention? If not, then let us come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O God of sympathy and tenderness, who surrounded Job when he was despondent and sent Jesus to bind the wounds of the afflicted, we give you thanks that you take pity upon us and nurse us to wholeness when we are distressed and forlorn. We give you thanks that even when despair so easily overtakes us, that you send your spirit to comfort our fears. Hear us as we pray for those confined by illness, and in the midst of their infirmities, help them to sense your healing presence, which bring peace to mind. Give them the patience which allows their bodies to draw upon the sources of regeneration, so necessary to health and vigor. When the days are full of fretting and nights prolong the anxiety over a new dawn of suffering, hold them in your bosom and grant them peace. Hear us as we pray for those who despair. When earthly hope seems to elude them, grant them a vision of your boundless mercy. Appear to them in sadness of their darkest moments and make real for them the victory of Christ's resurrection. Help them to hear the good news that transform lights out of darkness and may henceforth have confidence in your loving care. Hear us as we pray for those blessed with sound minds and well bodies. Help them to care for temples of your grace. Keep them from abusing what you intricately created and give them a discipline to look after themselves. We give you thanks for the countless mercies we take for granted, for movement, for strength, for our minds and our senses. Help us, O oh God, to take heed of our health as a gift freely given, and never cease to praise you for the grace it reflects. And Lord, we know that you are the great healer, the great physician for all to come to be healed. We know there are there's those out there who are struggling, whether it be physically, emotionally, financially, or spiritually. We know that there are those who are in the midst or rebuilding from tragedies. We ask for your mighty hand of healing to be upon them, to heal them like no one else can, and that they would in turn see your mighty hand in their healing. We ask now for those names we brought to you this morning and for those names we bring to you now in silence. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and east and west to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and then they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. <laughs> Praise to you, O God, for all of your works. You created the world and called it good, and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turn from you, you remain ever faithful. Therefore, with all creation, we sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Thank you, O oh God, for sending us your Son, who lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we may live, and all creation be restored. We give thanks to the Lord Jesus on the night he was, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my bread shed for you and for all. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup again, he gave thanks and praise to his disciples, and gave, showed, told them, This is the cup of my blood shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be used for us as the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body and blood for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and one another, until we feast with him and all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ taught us, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life, and this is the cup of salvation. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
The bread of life, let us take this together. The blood of Christ, let us take this together. Let us pray. God of abundance, with the spread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Join us now and stand if you're able in our closing hymn, hymn number 33, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never perish, but will have eternal life. Friends, my prayer is that you have seen the light of Jesus here today, and that you take that light of Jesus out into this world of darkness, so that others may see the light of Jesus in you, and that the world will become a little bit brighter with the light of Jesus Christ. May his grace, his peace, his honor, and glory be with you as you go forth from the sanctuary to know and to serve the Lord. And I hope we all meet again. If not before, we all gather together on that beautiful shore. God bless you all. Stay safe this week. Go in peace.